During the week leading up to Christmas, the boys left the children's home one by one to spend time with relatives. When night came on Christmas Eve, only one boy remained. Despite his house parents' best efforts, he couldn't get into the Christmas spirit. He went to his room, climbed into bed, and pulled the covers over his head. He was 14 and completely alone. You don't need Christmas gifts, he kept telling himself, but it didn't work. He cried himself to sleep. When he awoke Christmas morning, the silence was heavy. Nobody horsing around in the hall, nobody banging on the door. He rolled out of bed and noticed an envelope underneath his door. He shuffled over, picked it up. The handwriting on the envelope was unfamiliar. He ripped it open, and what happened next forever changed this boy's life. Welcome to Generosity at Work, a podcast that explores the ways generosity is at work in our professional lives, as well as how it's at work in the world. I'm Keith Jennings, a community impact executive with Jackson Healthcare. And in episode one, we're going to learn to think in a much bigger, more inclusive way than just giving back. And we're going to explore how our good intentions to help others can sometimes cause unintended harm. I hope you stick around, but more importantly, I hope what you learn in this episode will help you practice a more responsible, others-first form of generosity. There's a phrase that's been used so often it's become somewhat of a cliche, and that phrase is giving back. Now, don't get me wrong, giving back is not a bad thing. It's just limiting, and we'll get to that. But despite its overuse, I mean, giving back's a good thing, right? It's what people who care do. It's what people in businesses who have been rewarded by society are expected to do, or at least it's what we hope they will do. A few years ago, I caught myself using the phrase giving back a lot, which made sense. I oversee the community impact efforts of a large private organization. But the more I thought about it, the more that phrase started bothering me, I actually stopped using it. And I set out to find a bigger, better, more inclusive expression for what we were doing and trying to do. I needed a description, whether it was a word or a phrase or an idea, that's available to you and me, regardless of our title, our affluence, our influence, or our station in life. And I found it. As a matter of fact, it was right in front of me all along. But before we get to that, let's look more closely at this notion of giving back. There are at least two problems with the idea of giving back. First, it assumes that the receiving comes before the giving. In other words, something is given to you or you go out and get it, and then you give some of it back to society in some way. Could be a person or a group, could be your hometown or a family or school. Of course, the sibling of giving back is paying it forward. Something is given to you and instead of giving it back, you give it to an up-and-comer. The second problem, because of that first reason, is that giving back is assumed to be something done one day, once we're successful and able. And a common belief is that we should spend the first half of our lives chasing success, striving, working hard, making sacrifices, advancing, acquiring as much as we can over the course of our career. And then one day, in the second half of life, we can give back out of that success. I want to be super clear here. I don't believe giving back is a bad thing at all. It's terrific. But it's merely part of something much bigger and something much more inclusive. And that something is generosity. So what exactly is generosity? I mean, we talk about it. We value it. Heck, we want to be generous and do generous things. But what do we mean by generosity and what distinguishes generosity from giving back? This may surprise you, but the word generosity actually evolved out of root words tied to birthright and nobility. Words like genesis, genealogy, gentry, gender, as well as words like gentle and genius all share this root meaning of birth and status. During the 1600s, the word began to shift away from the literal ties to family heritage and nobility, and toward the idea of this nobility of spirit. 
Think courage, strength, gentleness, fairness. By the 1700s, the word took on the meaning we associate with it today. Generous meaning open-handedness and altruistic, uh, being liberal in giving of money and possession to others. A few years back, when I was getting into and learning about whiskey, one of the first things I heard someone say was this, that all bourbons are whiskey, but not all whiskeys are bourbons. Bourbon is merely one category of whiskey. There are many others, Irish whiskey, Scotch, Japanese, and Canadian whiskey, among others. And I've come to see generosity as being like whiskey and giving back as being like bourbon. All giving back is a form of generosity, but not all generosity takes the form of giving back. There are many other forms of generosity. The first and easiest form are simple acts of kindness. You buy someone a cup of coffee, deliver a meal to someone that's homebound, mow an elderly neighbor's yard, simply smile and be present and truly listen to someone. These are the few ways uh, that you and I can show kindness to one another. The next level of generosity is what we'll call giving. This can include volunteering at a local food pantry or shelter, serving on a nonprofit board, providing pro bono goods or services to people or organizations in need. It could be donating to or raising money for an important cause. Another form of generosity, let's call advocacy. You know, in Georgia, where our organization is headquartered, we have a program called the Georgia Court Appointed Special Advocates, uh, which we often refer to as Georgia CASA. Um, It's an organization, and it's, it's a nonprofit organization that trains volunteers to advocate for young people in foster care who have experienced abuse and neglect. This isn't the feel-good kind of photo-op type work we think about when we imagine generosity. Advocacy is a type of generosity that's filled with tensions. It's often thankless, and it offers no guarantees of success. But it can be generosity at a deeper, more personal level, and its impact can be profound. Maybe the deepest and most challenging form of generosity is self-sacrifice putting yourself in harm's way in order to protect another. It could be fostering or adopting a child, welcoming refugees into your home, allying with or affirming marginalized groups in ways that cost you and push you into the margins. Could be an anonymous gift from a donor like that young boy experienced. Our world needs more generous people, leaders, and businesses, but it's not as simple as it sounds. And we'll talk more about that after the break. This program is made possible by Jackson Healthcare, a family of highly specialized staffing search and technology companies. Headquartered in Metro Atlanta, we're powered by more than 2,600 associates and over 20,000 clinician providers covering all 50 U.S. states. Recognized year after year as a great place to work, our mission is to improve the delivery of patient care and the lives of everyone we touch. We're always looking for bright professionals who have a drive to serve others, grow professionally, and do the wise thing. That's you. Check us out at jacksonhealthcare.com. To be truly impactful, generosity requires an others-first orientation. Without this, our acts of kindness, giving, advocacy, and self-sacrifice, no matter how sincere they may be, can actually cause harm more than it can help. I discovered this other side of generosity when I learned about medical device graveyards in sub-Saharan Africa. What had happened is, in an effort to be generous, organizations sent secondhand medical equipment to hospitals throughout Africa. But a large portion of these devices, I've seen figures as high as 70%, sit idle because they're broken. No parts or technicians are available to service them. According to Robert Lupton, founder of Focus Community Strategies Urban Ministries here in Atlanta, uh, and he's author of the great books, Toxic Charity and Charity Detox, surprising little of the food pantries, clothing closets, mission trips, and other bastions of charitable giving done here in the U.S. and abroad actually help the poor. Why is this? Lupton says it's because giving, though well-intentioned, is often one way. It's us helping them. 
which can make those being served objects of pity. It harms our neighbor's dignity and can erode their work ethic by producing an unhealthy dependency between giver and recipient. Let's refer to this as self-first generosity. I see it play out continually. People give money, time, and other resources because it makes them look and feel good. But they give little to no thought about how it actually impacts those they're trying to help. So if doing more good in the world through more acts of giving is one side of generosity's coin, doing less harm in the world is generosity's other and equally important side. This philosophy also applies to how we as individuals and businesses work with and support our local nonprofit organizations. There's an expression in the nonprofit world called painting the walls. This refers to how some nonprofits have company teams and student teams and church teams paint the same wall over and over, week after week, because they don't want to turn away possible future donations and other support. But the demand from volunteer teams wanting to do good is more than many nonprofits have the people power to manage. Not to mention it takes them away from the real work of their mission. This brings us to a key takeaway in this episode. For an act to be truly generous, it must be two-dimensional. First, it must do good in the world, and two, it must do no harm. Unlike self-first generosity, let's refer to this as others' first generosity. Tom Shoes is an unfortunate example of an organization that did not approach generosity in this two-dimensional others' first way. Founded in 2006, Tom's became the poster child of how companies can grow, profit, and do good in the world. Sales skyrocketed as their buy one, give one shoe model connected with customers. Sadly, their model created a myriad of problems for those being helped. Critics have said that Tom's model undermined the economies of the developing countries they sought to help by putting local vendors out of business. And it didn't actually solve the root systemic problems that create poverty. Ultimately, it created a myriad of problems for the shoe brand as word of their harm and misreporting spread. Tom's almost went bankrupt in 2019, and today they no longer link the sale of shoes to giving to the poor. But here's here's the thing. I'm not sharing Tom's story with the intention of calling them out as evil or bad, From everything I've read over the years, I believe their intentions were sincere and done with a spirit of generosity. I'm sharing their story to reveal the responsibility we all have as professionals and as businesses to help others, if at all possible, without harming others. True generosity is others first. Remember that 14-year-old boy alone at the children's home on Christmas? Well, that was Rick Jackson, founder, chairman, and CEO of Jackson Healthcare, the organization behind this podcast. Here's a little more insight into his story and his words. I was in the foster care system. Uh, My background was not really unique. Uh, It's probably about the average situation that uh, even today that kids have because I'm still involved with them. You know, I went to eight different elementary schools and five different high schools. My mother was an alcoholic, uh, and so I went into the foster care system on my 13th birthday. And so I was, uh, during that time, I was was sent to the Methodist Children's Home, uh, and it was uh, sometime in early December, uh, about this time of year. Uh, And then, Christmas came around, and all of the kids in the cottages went home to somebody. So I was by myself, um, and, you know, uh, if you can imagine being a child and taken from your home uh, with a strange place, and going to bed on Christmas Eve, knowing that you're not gonna have a Christmas, uh, it's not a, it's a very difficult time it was for me. Uh, I cried myself to sleep that night, uh, Christmas Eve. I woke up the next morning 
and there was an envelope under my door. Uh, I picked it up, and there was a, a it said a, a gift from an anonymous donor, and it was a hundred dollar bill. It was more money than he had ever seen. He learned that there was someone out there who gave $100 bills to any child at the children's home on Christmas Day. And to this day, he's never known the person's identity. It was an act of generosity Rick never forgot. He used the money to buy himself the record player he always wanted, and then he used the remaining money to buy transistor radios for each boy that returned to the home without any gifts. That anonymous act of generosity was a transformative experience for Rick. It allowed him for the first time to be open to being cared for as well as being able to show others care. It just blew me away that somebody I didn't know gives me money for no reason, but, you know, without any hope of giving them back, a complete stranger. It really gave me hope of that people cared. That's the power of generosity. It's wonderfully contagious. We've talked about kindness being the simplest, easiest form of generosity. We've talked about giving as a form of generosity, and this can include time, money, resources, advice. This is where giving back lives. We've talked about advocacy and self-sacrifice as types of generosity. But it seems the one ingredient bringing lift to all of these forms of generosity is love. Love is the ultimate form of generosity. That's what Rick Jackson experienced that Christmas morning. And that's why he works tirelessly as an advocate for and supporter of young people in the foster care system today. In this episode, we started out with the idea of giving back, but we've discovered that generosity is a much bigger, more inclusive idea and practice. But the core lesson in this episode is that when it comes to our generosity efforts as individuals, as groups, and as organizations, we must be responsible. This means maximizing ways to help others while eliminating any unintended harm. This requires us to take an others first approach when it comes to helping and serving others. Now that we know what generosity is and the power it can have in our workplace and in our world, it brings up some new questions. How do acts of generosity affect us physically and mentally and relationally? Are we naturally generous or do we lie to ourselves about how generous we actually are? And Are there relationships or correlations between generosity and success? We'll cover these and so much more in episode two. Until then, why don't you do something kind for a colleague, customer, or client right now? Go for it. Generosity at Work is produced by Jackson Healthcare's Love Lifts Community Impact Platform. This is a free resource for professionals seeking to go beyond profit and be a force for good in their communities. Learn more about Jackson Healthcare and its community impact work at jacksonhealthcare.com.